please welcome Jake Humphrey. <laughs> Love the duvet. Do, do you like the duvet? It's a great look, the duvet. I can wear it well, <laughs> can't, can't you? I? Can't you? You're so much taller off the telly. Is that right? Yes. Are you chatting me up already? A little bit. <laughs> All, always. How tall bit. are you? Uh, about six foot three. Ooh. Six foot four, if I'm trying to impress people. Is that why your book's called High oh, Performance? Yes. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> so here we go. High performance, yeah. uh, sort of taken from the podcast of, right. the, of the same name. Tell us a little bit about, I mean, obviously it is about high performing people, yes. but what, what's the sort of ethos behind it? I suppose the ethos behind it is that we all think that high performance is this difficult to reach ethereal thing that belongs to other people. And we can talk about this a bit because I grew up thinking that other people were the born into success. Mm -hmm. You know, I had an amazing upbringing. Mum was a teacher, dad was a charity worker, lived in a tiny village in wonderful Norfolk. And I just thought great things belong to other people. And it was only when I ended up working in Formula One and in this very studio on the children's BBC and then in football that I got the chance to speak to people. And they all said, well, there isn't really a secret. There's what we call on the podcast world-class basics that you can do every single day. And we've really broken down high performance in 150 episodes to three sentences, really. Do the best you can where you are with what you've got. That is high performance. It's high happiness, high self-worth speaking well to yourself mentally every day. Um, and it's, it's been a big hit, you know, particularly among young men, which is important for us. It is that thing, isn't it, of, of constantly sort of pursuing mm. that light at the end of the tunnel that mm. you never quite get to. Yeah, but that's also, like, life tricks you right into thinking that there's this great moment where suddenly we're all going to be happy. And I definitely thought that, you know, and we all do it when I get that car, when I get that promotion, mm. when I get that new house, when I have that child, when I have that marriage. And then we get there and we realise that although it's OK, it isn't anything like what we thought it was going to be, which is the moment where, you know, the clouds part and it's mm. just a hallelujah moment. And then we, <laughs> and then we try and find the, else. Next one, yeah. and then the next one. And basically, this is delaying our happiness. And mm. I think if we can all live a life where we realise we're enough, we're doing the best we can, and it's never too late, you know, for everyone listening to this, the Stoics, who I, I love yeah. listening to the Stoics, they had a great phrase, which is, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, like, life's a struggle and I'm delaying my happiness and, and, you know, I don't really see a way forwards, then speak to someone, what, listen to our podcast, What was buy the, the point journal. in your... Because they always sort of say a lot of people, when they get to the point where they start thinking like this, is that they have to reach a bit of a rock bottom. Yeah. What, what was your sort of rock bottom in your life? So I suppose I also looked at successful people and thought, like, it was just a linear path, like, life is just like that. And it isn't like that at all, you know. If I go right back to the very beginning, sacked from McDonald's for a lack of communication skills. <laughs> yeah. All uh, you have to do is say, hello, what do you want? embarrassing, <laughs> isn't it? It was embarrassing. It's a bit embarrassing. It was embarrassing. Yeah. Um, and then I, I had a, a tragic moment when my grandma sadly took her own life when I was only a teenager. Oh, wow. And that, that's particularly devastating because you... You look at your grandparents and you think, they've got it sorted, mm. they're OK. And, you know, she had her own trauma. My grandfather had a bad farming accident and she was his carer. And when he passed away, it was just too much for her. So that was, um, that was a knock. Not long after How old were that, you there? I, would have, I was doing my A-levels at the time. Right. Mm. And not long after that, I failed all three of them. I got an Ooh. E, an N and a U. And in those days, at the school I went to, you had to ask one of the teachers if you could return to the school which was easy because my mum was a teacher at the school. <laughs> so you can understand the situation that I was in at that point. And that, actually, it was the A-level failure that I got a letter from a local TV channel when I went back to redo my exams, mm. saying, we're looking for politics students to help us out on a TV show. I went there, I did some work experience, ended up in this studio working on Children's BBC. But then I had another difficult time because I was away from home and, you, you but know... let me just interrupt you now. Having uh, worked in, in television as someone who made lots of programmes for young people, I know there was huge rivalry yeah. between all the presenters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you might have come to present a <clears throat> children's programme and present Correct. to the outside world, smiley face, happy to be here, but behind the scenes it must have been tough. Yeah, because if you think about it, Maybe it's a bit different now, but in those days, everyone on Children's BBC wanted to be, the, like, the next big thing. Yeah. You know, and there was an amazing band of people. There's wonderful Angelica and Simon. You know, I just went and saw Holly next door in the, in the studio next door doing this morning, and we worked in this studio together. So I think that that's the funny thing about life, right? You think that when you get to a certain place, 
Mm. You're just doing your job. But actually, does getting there give you all the vitamins and minerals you need to deal with the situations that you find yourself in? So there was a bit of that, and understandable. Oh, more than a bit. Mm, maybe. Uh, <laughs> you're being too nice. Though, you know. But also, uh, do you think as well, because some people, especially when you're younger, you have this plan of this is what I want to be. Mm. And yeah. sometimes life doesn't take you on that journey. So instead of just thinking, I'm a failure, I didn't make it, mm. that's mm. it. Yeah. You can go down different paths and end up... Totally. End up being successful in something you never yeah. even thought of. I mean, one of the podcast guests we had on who was incredible was Bear Grylls. And my son, little Sebastian, I think he's watching at home. Where is he? Hi, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Flo. Um, he's obsessed with Bear Grylls. Mm. And Bear said the most amazing thing to him. He's, he had him on the start of the podcast and said, can I introduce my son? It was over, like, done over Zoom. And he said, he said listen, Seb, don't win at everything. Be the person who, when they leave school, has been told a thousand times, it isn't you. You're not in the school team. You're not the prefect. You're not the head of year. You haven't got an A. Because every single time you get told no, and you know, those were all moments in my life where I was told no mm. or things went wrong, it adds to that resilience. It gives you the little bit of armour that you need so that when we have young people going out and having their, maybe their first failed job interview at 21, mm. they can dust themselves down and go again. Because when mm. you end up in an industry like you've worked in and I've worked in and we've all been involved mm. in, you do need resilience, and we have to build that in our you have to, yeah. You have to build your self-esteem <coughs> because uh, all work is competitive. Mm. People pretend it isn't, but there's always, always someone who's angling for a promotion or is going to yeah. push you out of the way, and you have to understand how yeah. to deal with that. Mm. I think probably back then I wrapped all my self-worth up in being on BBC One. So you'd mm -hmm. start in this studio on the children's BBC channel, then you might go to BBC Two, and if you got onto BBC One, you were like, yes, I've done yeah. it. And I think we all do that. You know, we all realise. My wife worked here on Strictly Come Dancing, and then when we had children, she stopped, we moved back to Norfolk. She found it really hard, Harry, yeah. for a few months, mm -hmm. because she suddenly she wasn't hanging out with celebrities and all these things, and then she came to the realisation that her self-worth as an amazing mum and an incredible daughter, like, so loyal, so loving. That's yeah. nothing to do with her job. Hanging out with her. celebrities is overrated, I'm going <laughs> yeah. to Isn't it? Uh, Isn't now, it? listen, yeah. we want to, before you go, we always yeah. like to involve you, uh, so our guest, in our, our topic. Have you put up your Christmas decorations yet? No. I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling even to turn the heating on at the moment, so... Um, <laughs> Christmas, <laughs> Christmas decorations at some point, yeah. We, we do like to go early in our house, yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. OK. Well, Katie at home, uh, she says, I've had mine up since October the 16th. <gasps> no, Katie. No. Wow. No. Yes. It can't, can't be before Halloween, right? It's yeah, like... there, there it is. There <laughs> it is. And Gemma, yes, if it makes us feel happy, go for it. Yes, I agree. Oh. Sharon, she's got just her twig light at the moment. I've got it. <laughs> and James, yes, I love mine up early. Ooh. Less said about that, the better. All right, Jake. <laughs> right, well, uh, Jake, a pleasure. Lovely to see you. Do come Thank back you again. Thank you so much for uh, having me. Thank you. <laughs>